Hi guys, it's Blakey for Shaman's Forge Bushcraft. Okay. My lost video that I spoke of in an earlier video, and for those of you that don't know, I had a video where I dealt with my percussion revolver series that got somehow corrupted and I had to get rid of it. And I have already made a video talking about what was on it, but I left out an important step here. And I want to backtrack a little bit so that you understand. Okay, here is the order of operations with a percussion revolver. Number one, you've gotten it new, you clean it, you break it down, you deburr it. Step two, you test fire it for mechanical function. Make sure everything works before we go any farther. Step three, load development to get a group. Step four, moving that group's windage. Step five, moving that group's elevation. Step six, adding sights to compensate and make range. And then step seven, tips and tricks to make it yours. So, with that statement, today I want to talk about load development, okay? You have got the gun, cleaned it, deburred it, test fired it. When I say test fire, I mean just pour powder in the cylinder about three quarters away or fill it up, whatever you want to do, put the ball in it, go out and shoot it. Don't worry about a group, just make sure it's functionally working. All the cylinders fire, etc. Now we're going to do load development. And load development is going to tell me how much powder to utilize for this gun. Now, what Colt said in his literature whenever he was selling the guns was to simply fill the cylinder full, no wad, no nothing, put the ball into it, crush it down, cap it, and fire it. In the black powder era, you wanted a more powerful gun, you put more powder, you lengthened it, you went to a heavier bullet. Thus, in like 45 uh, Buffalo guns, you had 4560, 4565, 4575, 4570, 4590, 45110, 45120. They just lengthened the case and added more powder, maybe went to a heavier bullet because I want more horsepower. In our modern smokeless, that don't work. You change the chemistry and get a more powerful powder, but they had a given power, so to speak. So you just needed more powder to equal power. So whenever Colt designed the 36 belt gun, there was X amount of power he was going for, thus the amount of powder that was put into it. Now, in modern terms, how do you figure out what to do with yours? Well, the first thing we need to know is on your gun, what is the maximum capacity of the cylinder? And how we do that, you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to need a powder flask of powder, powder you're going to use. What powder do you use with cap and ball revolvers? I had several people ask this. I'll address it at this time. You want 3F black powder. You can also use 2F. You want Pyrodex P or Pyrodex RS or several of the other substitutes. I am not that versed in the other substitutes. So for my recommendation, stick with either Pyrodex or black powder. Okay? You will find literature that says using 4F in a revolver. Back in the 70s, Lyman had a lab do a test on that. They took a 51 Navy modern replica and an 1860 Army modern replica, and they drilled a hole in the chamber up here, and they put a very special device on it. And in a lab setting, they fired it with 2F, 3F, 4F, to see if it was generating pressures that were too dangerous to use. In all the cases, it was safe to use. 
I don't recommend using 4F in a 44 caliber or a walk or anything like that. And we're going to get to how that comes into play in a second. Hang with me. I recommend 3F for all of them. If you have something really small, like a 31 caliber Baby Dragoon or one of them little 31 caliber Remingtons, you can use 4F. The powder capacity is so small, you're not going to have to worry about it. So, that's what powder. Now back to this. What you're going to need is a flask of powder, and you're going to need a powder measure, an adjustable powder measure. Now this one goes to 100, and it's granulated in tens. This is what I'm going to use. This is something like you can get. They're very cheap, easy to pick up. But if you're going to be using any of this stuff for the long term, these are going to become very useful, both for loading like this and also for making up your paper cartridges, your reloadable cartridge tubes like I've showed you. Being able to measure your powder out is a real advantage. So for this demonstration, I'm going to take the Remington. You do the same thing with the Colt. Making sure you're unloaded. You want to remove the cylinder from your gun. And you need something to pour powder out on. So I'm going to use this piece of paper. Okay. So with the cylinder empty, I'm going to take my Pyrodex and I'm going to fill it all the way to the very tippy tippy top. Now I'm going to take my knuckle and lightly tap it, just to settle the powder, and then wipe it off. Now I have a full top to bottom chamber capacity. I now drop my powder measure down to maximum size. I'm going to pour that powder into my powder measure, just like that, making sure I got all of it. Now I'm going to put my finger across the top and gently slide this up until it contacts with my finger. Then I'm going to tighten the nut. And what this says it is that the total bottom to top maximum chamber capacity, and I'm going to put this powder back before I spill it. What I like about these brass flasks, you can unscrew the bottom and just dump it in in bulk. Easy to fill. Notice that it compresses it a little bit. That we'll get to in a minute. The compressibility of powder is something that we're counting on. Okay, that's all of it. Now that extra powder I spilled off right there, I'm going to pour in there, utilizing the paper. There. Now. Turn around in the driveway. Hmm. I'm in the middle of nowhere out here. So, now getting out my eyes and looking at it, it says that Remington's absolute bottom to top, every inch of it is 50 grains. Now, of course, you can't load that. There's no projectile. But that tells me what the capacity is. And I should do that all the way around and check, make sure they're the same. That'll indicate real quick that this one's got a problem. They didn't drill it deep enough. Suddenly, 50, 50, 50, 40, you understand. So now, I know that chamber capacity is 50, max. My bullet and wad is gonna take up at least 15 grains of space. So about 35 grains would be the maximum I would put in here. Now. Black powder is much like gasoline or an internal combustion engine. In an internal combustion engine, if you have too much fuel for oxygen, it's called running rich, and it burns real dirty. You got a lot of, there's not enough air to completely combust the fuel, and so it's very dirty. So if you overload a gun, you end up with a lot of fouling because there's not enough air and not enough time to completely burn it and get it out the barrel. 
On the other end of that, too little, and the, the grains are not touching tight enough, not enough compression, and the powder is not sufficiently burning. There's too much air space, okay? So you notice I tapped it with a knuckle. I'm settling it, getting the excess air out. Now when I ram it, I am compressing the powder. So, knowing that this one's maximum charge is 35, I'm gonna start 10 below that at 25. I'm gonna load 25 grains. I'm going to get up onto my bench. I'm going to aim at a target. Now, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm gonna aim at my target. I'm going to, like you saw in my shooting video, my sighting in, I'm gonna squeeze them very carefully, very slowly, don't get in no hurry, so that I'm putting my best effort for every shot, okay? Now, what's the group look like? Is it a group? Is it a pattern they're just all over the place? Okay, that's 25. I'll now go up to 30. I will shoot that. Same way. I will then go to 35. Does the group shrink? Does it get bigger? Now let's say, for the sake of argument, that I go to 35 and the group is a little bit better. I'll then add half the distance between the marks, which would be like two more grains. So it's like 37. And I'll squeeze it. I'm not adding any appreciable increase in power. What I am adding by adding these little bits of powder is more compression. And thus, squeezing those particles closer together to get a better, more uniform combustion. Just like in a car, I'm like dialing in the fuel ratio, okay? Now, I'm of course gonna have the bullet and my Wonder Wad in there. I mean my uh, Ox Yoke or whatever felt wad. So that's the space I'm taking up. So that compression, the compression is what's gonna regulate my fuel mixture. I shoot and I look for the best group. I go up and down when I this group was good, this group was a little worse, I'll split the difference. So if it was 30 and 40, I'll do 35. If it was 35 and 30, I'll do halfway mark, 33, you see. Until I get the gun to do a group. Now, on the Colt, there is a sometimes occurring condition I want to talk about right here. And that is the Wandering Zero. I have not seen this in a Remington. A wandering zero occurs when I have fired and I have made a group. Now you remember in my sighting in video I shot four groups at the same point to guarantee I got a group. I'm doing that for the reason of making sure that this is consistently where it's going and that the gun is not wandering. Okay. The way a Colt is designed with the frame and barrel separate and the pin holding it, upon firing, the bullet and all that pressure transfers to the barrel. The steel stretches minutely and begins to elongate as that bullet goes up the barrel. This pulls the barrel. It wants to go off the gun, but the wedge keeps it in place. When the bullet exits the barrel, the steel kind of rebounds back, it pulls back in. A condition that can occur is if the head space on the base pin is binding, what happens is as it comes back, it kind of torques it. Now, how you'll see this is you will have a, a group where I will take the barrel off the gun for cleaning, loading, whatever. I will then fire it and my very first round goes here. And the rest of my group goes over here in sort of a pattern. I can take the barrel off, put it back on and it goes here and the rest of the group. What's happening is that when I take the barrel off the gun, I remove any head space binding and when I put it back on the gun, there is no bind until I fire and then it binds, okay? 
Now, this normally happens when you have a very tight base pin because in the base pin hole right here, they're using an end mill to go into it, and at the very end of it, it can be kind of chattered, and though that's gripping the base pin funny. A way to check it is take it and turn the barrel sideways on a coal and slide it in the base pin, and kind of turn it and see if it's binding. If it's like, you know, then you've got a headspace problem in there, and you've got what's called wandering zero. This one is actually a good fit. It should be very snug. Okay, what do you do to fix that? The sides of the slots, make sure, like we saw in my D burr, and up here at the very top, make sure that it's got a bevel going all the way around. Also, go across the very end and make sure that. And then in here, where the base pin goes, I take a cleaning rod with like a 40 caliber or a 38 caliber old cleaning brush, and I take that short section, chuck it up in a power drill, and then onto the cleaning tip, I add coarse steel wool. And I will feed that down in there till it bottoms out and I'll spin it with the drill. Zzz, pull it out, refluff it, put it back in there. Zzz, and I will polish that head in there. That normally cures the wandering zero. Okay? The other thing is the very bottom down here. Now, let me get closer so you can see this better. I know, what's this got to do with load development? Well, you're getting a twofer. Okay, right here where this joins the barrel. Sometimes you'll get a gun that, you don't see this on the 51 Navy because it's straight down, but on this slimline uh, 1860 Army 61, etc., you'll do it because it's transferring the energy this way. You'll shoot a couple of rounds and you'll watch your zero start going up. The group will start climbing up. What's happening is the barrel is warming up and expanding and this is too tight and it's pushing up on the barrel. So what you want to do is take this, wrap a piece of sandpaper around a flat edge and sit there and go across and make it flat and just take a couple of thousandths off. That takes care of it. Okay, so we found out the capacity of the cylinder. That's given us a starting point. The rammer can only go so deep. And so people that say that they only shoot 15 grains in it, the, bulk, the bullet can only seat down so far and then it's there. You never, ever, ever, ever want an airspace in a cylinder or in any muzzleloader. That can cause something called detonation and it can bust the gun. I know people are going to argue that, but you can look in the artillery manuals and they talk about that in a cannon and it's just a bigger version. So it's never, ever, ever a good idea to have any kind of airspace between the powder charge and the bullet. It acts like an obstruction. Okay? So you want to fill the capacity of the cylinder. And it doesn't mean you got to load it all the way to the top. Remember, we're learning the group. I figured out that my capacity should be between 35 and 40 grains max because there's going to be some compression. So I'm going to start out at 25 and work my way up till I find the best group. Once I find the best group, stop. If you add a little bit more and add a little bit more, you'll watch the group grow up. Think of it kind of like an hourglass shape. It's coming, it's coming, you've got optimum, and then that fuel ratio is gone. So now you got too much fuel to oxygen. So you want the optimum load. Okay? We have found the load and it is now grouping on target like we want. Now we go to the next step, sighting in. And that's what I showed you in that video. Me getting on target very carefully and I fired several groups to make sure it's not wandering, that it's staying in one position. Once I have my group, now I'm going to move my sights for windage. And we'll deal with that with the next video. I'm Blackie for Shaman's Forge Bushcraft. Wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.